move on and invite the applicant's agent uh, to speak. Now, um, I've got a list as long as my arm here. So could um, the main uh, presenter identify themselves and just say who it could you could yeah could you just say well, I, hi, I'm, Jacobson. I'm the agent um speaking on behalf of the applicant we also have various other people here um to speak and answer questions but it will be myself and the architect Nazar um speaking doing an initial speech for three minutes right uh, it would be just you alone for, for the three uh, Nazar minutes. is speaking first then it will be me sorry who who's speaking first Mazar. Right. Well, OK, thank you very much. So uh, how are you going to split the time? So we've got about half each. So we'll just continue, I think, through. So Nazar, I don't know if you could turn your, like, what, turn your camera on. Right. Oh, could you just identify? Right. Thank you. So um, thank you. Uh, right, Nazar, I can see you now on my screen. So who's going to who intends to speak first? I'll be speaking first, Chair. Righto. So if you could um, initially, thank you for that. If you could initially introduce yourself and and uh, state your role um, in in uh, this application this evening, and then uh, presumably you've sort of timed it between you and then uh, Miss Jenkins. So if we if you introduce yourselves initially and then we'll start the, the, the clock and you'll get the, whoever's speaking at the time, presumably it'll be you, Miss um, Jen Jenkinson, um, uh, you'll get a 30 minute, uh, 30 seconds, I beg your pardon, uh, warning in advance um, should you require the full uh, time. So if you could just initially introduce yourselves and then we'll start the clock, our last officers to start the clock. Thank you. OK, well, I'll Thank you, Chair. Uh, my name is Nazar Saig. I'm the director from Glass Architects and we're the architects on the scheme. Right, so thank you. And Ms. Jenkinson, similarly, could you do the same, please? Sure. Hi, I'm Laura Jenkinson. I am the Chartered Planner um, dealing with the uh, development. Right, uh, so when you're ready, uh, Mr. Saig, if you like to start presenting, we'll start the clock. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. I'll begin now. The officer's report and representation to committee provide strong support for the application, so I'll keep this short. However, I just wanted to highlight a few important points. Firstly, as you will have heard, we've engaged positively and collaboratively with officers throughout this process. A pre-application meeting was held prior to submission and we followed officers' advice in full. Following submission, we have worked hard to respond to all representations received and as such, we've incorporated a number of design changes into the scheme that have been agreed with officers, including a reduction in the number of flats from six to five, a reduction in mass and form to the south and west, removal of the lift overrun and lift access, a setback of two metres from the east elevation from lower floors. Indeed, recognising the efforts we've made, paragraph seven of the committee report states, the scale, massing and detailed design responds appropriately to the modern townscape and it would be sympathetic to the historic properties within the locality and the neighbouring conservation area. And paragraph 41 of the report also states the proposals will provide an improvement over the existing appearance of 48 Grange Walk and responds to the emerging character of the local area. The report also concludes the proposals would receive sufficient daylight and sunlight and in respect of impact to adjoining properties, it would be commensurate to the site's urban location. I'll hand over to Laura. We are pleased that officers are able to provide strong support for this application. We have sought to engage with those neighbours within closest proximity and we note the committee report has clarified the concerns raised previously by residents and councillors in relation to building heights and daylight and sunlight impacts. We have also offered to meet with ward councillors on a number of occasions to explain the proposals. A total of 27 letters have been received in support of the application, largely as a result of the high quality design and the improvements to the facade, which will address perceived fire issues now a material planning consideration. The committee report is clear that the development has not been purposely phased. 48 Grange Walk was completed over 10 years ago. Planning permission for 46 to 47 Grange Walk was granted over four years ago when only five stories was supported by officers. And only when the 2016 permission had already commenced and was close to completion were officers supported on the current proposals following completion of Corio House. In summary, the proposals will offer the following planning benefits. The provision of five new high quality homes, offering a range of dwelling types, a development of exemplary quality that respects the character of the area in relation to height, scale and massing, allows the existing dated building to be upgraded, remedying its perceived susceptibility to fire risk, high quality private and communal amenity space, 
enhancements to the public realm within the vicinity of the site. Our client has a strong track record of delivering its planning permissions in Southwark spanning 15 years. If planning permission is granted, the proposals will be implemented straight away, delivering much needed new housing and ensuring existing re residents benefit from much needed cladding improvements. For these reasons, I hope the committee will feel able to support the officer's recommendation for approval tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to both of you. Um, do members have any questions for the applicants, agents? please? None whatsoever at this moment in time. Uh, Councillor Noakes, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Uh, and thank you for your presentation. Um, I just wondered, uh, I don't know if you want to say anything uh, any more in regards to, I think two of the principal concerns from the objectors obviously relate to height and also the impact on the conservation area, accepting of course that this site sits with it outside the uh, conservation area but obviously it's it's visual impact on the conservation area so I just wondered if you could perhaps directly address those two points and the other thing is like can you provide any clarity in regards to the 2015 application was that from yourselves or not I don't know if that was or not or if you know anything about that thank you thanks um Icarus, did you want to go first on the um heritage impacts um, yes, if I, if I may, my name is Ignis Fronman. Um, I'm a member of the uh, Institute of Historic Building Conservation. Um, I'm the heritage consultant on this project. Um, I think in terms of the, the impacts on the conservation area, um, what the guidance on setting tells us to do, and this is echoed in the NPPF, is first of all to look at the nature of the views and what they contribute to the appreciation of the conservation area. Um, we've looked very carefully at the geometry of the streets and we've looked at the positioning of our site in relation to the closest buildings in the conservation area, which are which which is the terrace that kind of sticks out a bit like a finger towards um, towards outside. Um, now, we, we we've picked a number of views, um, and we've very carefully looked at this. The proposed development um, can't be seen. Um, above those buildings, and it is part of a modern townscape, um, which is actually recognised in the Conservation Area Character Appraisal, which is adopted by the Council, um, which talks about the contrast um, in the, 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 the nature and the type of development to the east of the conservation area, um, and that's the area, of course, where the site is located. And so it's a very varied um, townscape context, um, and as you've heard from your officers, um, it's townscape context within which um, the, the relative building heights are similar to that being proposed. Um, and in that sense, um, it, it, the, the proposal um, doesn't do anything that doesn't already exist, but what it does do is it makes a transition um, between Correo House and uh, the conservation area. So it steps deliberately towards the conservation area. Uh, thank you. Uh, Council next, do you have a supplemental or can we move on to? I, I, I mean, I, the, only, the only sort of comeback I would make, I, I think um, Ignis was saying that it's that the, the proposed extension steps down from Correo House, but I, I think it's actually slightly taller than Correo House. So I, I don't know if I misunderstood. There was a slight break in your what you said. But um, and then the other point was just about whether they had any knowledge of the 2015 application. I don't know if that relates to them or not. Uh, um, if I could just very briefly pick up on that. I mean, um, we are talking about 10 centimetres in terms of the height differential um, between Correo House and this development, which really, I think, to the naked eye would be imperceptible if you're standing on the street and looking at those two. So um, so I think in reality, that that's not something which would lead to an impact. I mean, I, I think um, I don't think I've, I've ever heard of, of an impact um, due to a 10 centimetre increase in height. Well, I would argue 10 centimetres is 10 centimetres. It's an increase. Anyway, moving on, what do I know? Um, Councillor Seaton. Uh, and thank you, Chair. And I Chair, could we just hear whether they did have any knowledge of the 2015 application? Yeah, I'm happy to answer this question. So uh, the 2015 application you're referring to was actually pre-application advice. So it wasn't actually a planning application. And um, I personally wasn't involved, but I have read the pre-application response and it's very clear that um, officers weren't supportive of a taller building at that time that was actually before any planning application had been submitted for 46 to 47 Grange Walk 
I think it's worth pointing out that since that pre-application advice was, was issued, there has been a change in planning policy. We have a London plan um, that's been adopted and there is um, a policy drive to optimise brownfield sites, um, noting the uh, housing crisis that we have here in London and across the UK. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Thank apologies, you. Chair. Could, could I just add to Councillor David uh, in terms of the height of Corio? Because our building, uh, Corio is overall higher than our building. Our, our building corresponds to the, 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 the section of Corio that is uh, adjacent to us. So the overall height of Corio uh, towards the back, there are other elements to it which are taller. So that's just something that I put add in there. Thank, thank you. Um, Councillor Seaton. And, and thank you, Chair. And I want to thank Laura and Azair for the presentation and responses to questions thus far. Um, my initial question, Chair, and this continues the, the current theme on the uh, potential for phase development. Um, I, I wonder if the applicants acknowledge the response to my question on whether or not this development will create a single planning unit. Do you, do you accept that it will create a single planning unit? So um, we do have our um, legal advisor here to answer any specific questions on phasing. But I mean, ultimately, I think um, the question um, in hand really, you know, has this development been purposely phased to avoid affordable housing? I think that's the question that... Um, well, no, my, my question is very clear. I'm sorry, Chair. My question is, do you accept that this will create a single planning unit? I don't know if, Anthony, you wanted to step in here and, and answer that question. Um, oh, sorry, I had a bit of a technical error. Sorry, my name is Anthony McNamee. I'm here for the applicant on planning law matters. Um, it, what, what, what is your role, uh, Mr. McName? So I'm a solicitor on behalf of the applicant. Right, okay, thank you. Okay, mm -hmm. if you'd like to respond to Councillor Seaton's question on whether you consider um, it to, to be, once it's been built out, one single development, please. I mean, I'm, I'm afraid I have to follow John Gorst's logic in that there's no hard and fast rule on whether or not you have a single site. But assuming this site was developed in line with the application, applications coming after that would still fall to be considered by the relevant planning policies on whether or not they create additional units that need to be affordable or to provide benefits of other kinds. The key point is the policy that considers this application asks the question of, has there been a conscious effort to deliberately phase to avoid affordable housing? And at no point in, in, the, in the history of number 46, 47 and 48, has it been one site? It's developed in a, 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 it may seem inappropriate to say this, it's developed in a very piecemeal and actually unplanned fashion over time. I'm really sorry, Chair, to interrupt, but my question is pretty clear. Um, does the applicant uh, accept that this, once completed, will be a single planning unit? Is it yes or no? We, we, we know about, we've, re we've read the report, we've seen the addendum, we have the members pack, we know the background. My question is really quite straightforward. So I've got other questions I would like to ask. So can you just simply answer right. my question? Do you accept that this will create a single planning unit? Yes or no? Unfortunately, it, it's, it's a simple question, but as with lots of simple questions, there isn't a simple answer to it. And there is no hard and fast rule that I can apply. Forgive me, respectfully, no. we've heard from our legal officer, and legal officer says that uh, ultimately it will create a single unit. I just need you to either accept that as being a logical rationale outcome or not. Now I know what my follow-up question will be. What? Yeah, I mean, just to with jump all due respect. Uh, excuse me, just one person at a time, um, one speaker at a time. Uh, Mr. McName, if you could just answer the question without sort of... Um, uh, sort of, for want of a better phrase, sort of pussyfooting uh, uh, around it. We we can always then refer back to the officers, but it's unhelpful if you refer to 
um, our legal officer, because the, the question is 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 being um, posed to, and directed at you. So if you yep, can yep. give your own independent, if you could give your own independent response, that would be really helpful. Because the question has already been raised with our own legal officer. That that would be really helpful because um, I'm also. Also, I'm aware, as, as, as Councillor Seaton has alluded, he's got some follow-up questions. Yep. Yep. No, so if you, if you could just be as succinct as, as possible, that'd be really, really helpful. Uh, and it'd be really helpful to members as well, please. Thank you. In, in that case, for future planning applications, it may be possible to consider this as one site. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that response. And if I may, Chair, my, my follow-up question. Um, uh, at, at what point did you inform officers uh, that the addresses uh, 47, 48, 49 are all in the same ultimate owner? So is that a question to um, the uh, legal? The, uh, the it could be to the legal or to lawyer, I, I don't right. mind. I just want to clarify at what, at what point did you inform officers that the addresses concerned were all in the ultimate, ultimately in the same owner, despite the fact the applicant names were different. So Ms. Jenkinson, just, uh, if you don't mind, if you could. Yeah, respond, that's please. fine. I'm happy to answer this question. I think you know, um, um, the council's legal officer has referred to the fact that obviously ownership um, doesn't necessarily define whether a development is purposely phased for the purposes of affordable housing or not. But I think it's just worth pointing out. Um, that um, actually the ownership um, has um, changed over the years. So um, Mayfield Property Group, the current owner, was actually incorporated in 2012. Um, number 48 Grange Walk was purchased in 2007 under Commodore Development. It was completed in 2010, and at the time, um, Joseph Mansour of Mayfield uh, only owned 10% of the business. Only in September 2019 did Mayfield assume 100% ownership, um, and that was on the freehold. Um, number 46 to 47 Grange Walk. Um, number 46 Grange Walk was purchased in 2017 by 48 Grange Walk Limited. Um, that is owned 100% by um, Mayfield Property Group. Number 47 Grange Walk was purchased in 2015, um, again by Mayfield Property Group. Um, uh, but ultimately, I think the point to mention is the finance agreement for the delivery of 46 to 47 Grange Walk um, was required to be, um, it was required that the development should be delivered. So um, there wasn't uh, any uh, ability to actually um, add to that development um, um, post, post approval. So uh, I think, again, we don't want to talk, we don't want to get hung up about ownership, but the ownership has changed over the years. And I think that is not necessarily a determining factor for whether forgive a site me, Chair, has been faced in any case. Forgive me for interrupting. My question is pretty clear. At what point did you inform officers that the ultimate ownership for each of these properties is ultimately in a single ownership? Yeah. Um, as part of any planning application, uh, apologies, not... sorry for interrupting. Um, as part of any planning application submission, you are required to serve notice um, on the application forms to um, those owners um, who um, uh, are effectively a freehold or those that have um, seven years remaining on their lease. So um, on submission of, of all applications, we're required to serve notice. However, you know, ultimately, um, there isn't a, 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 an absolute requirement to provide details of ownership as part of any planning application apart from uh, on the application form. Thank you. And, and if I may, Chair, so in other words, the, um, the officers were not informed. And if I may, Chair, just, just my last question for now um, on this point of potential phase development. Uh, if you had the opportunity in, in 2015 uh, to build higher, uh, officers clearly, sorry, 17, officers clearly informed you that that was not possible because of the uh, Collier House um, position at that time. Um, you would have built higher. Uh, and of course, you own the adjacent properties. So the only reason why if this this didn't happen at the earlier stage is because of the Collier House um, position. Am I correct in saying that? Is, is, is my observation correct? Uh, law or legal officer, I don't mind. Um, if, you, if you don't mind, Miss Jenkinson, if you could respond. Yes, that's fine. Yeah, Thanks. I mean, ultimately, as you know, I mean, we've, we've, very, we've been very um, transparent with um, officers and members about the fact that we were seeking 
um, you know, at all development from the outset, but that wasn't supported um, by officers, hence why um, we went in with the, the five stories. I think um, just on that, I think just, just to add to the point I made earlier, we did actually, we were very clear about ownership as part of any pre-application request as well. So our officers were aware of that as part of any pre-application request and any planning application. So we have been very open and honest about that. Um, so I think with regards to um, actually, um, I suppose, um, the, the planning application that we have submitted, we would have actually designed the building differently had we um, uh, been able to um, uh, have support from office for eight stories. So the um, construction is actually very um, complicated. So we've got to cantilever um, across number 48, which adds a lot of expense. Um, so that it's not a straightforward construction process. So I think that's also worth bearing in mind on this phase development point, because ultimately, if we were seeking, um, you know, permission and we would got we would have got permission from the outset for the eight story scheme, yes, it would have been um, liable for affordable. Yes, we would our client would have been happy to to to, to pay um, or provide affordable, but that wasn't the case. Officers weren't supportive, and as a result of the fact that we've come in later. We now have a very expensive structure that we have to come to lever over number 48, but but we accept that and that's you know just just what's happened. And I think that's because of the piecemeal way that the development has come forward. I don't know if Anthony, you wanted to add anything to that. Yes, sorry. Again, the, the issue of ownership is, has been considered in case law, and it's not determinative to the question of phasing and the, the, the overall nature of the scheme. Additionally, the, the Southwark Core Strategy Policy, Strategic Policy 6 refers to schemes being deliberately artificially phased or subdivided to avoid affordable. I think our client wanted to go higher previously but was told not to and indeed couldn't do that. It was only as a result of changing circumstances with the existence of Corio, with the changes in planning policy, that an opportunity to add some more house, uh, some more living accommodation came forward. Um, Councillor Seaton, I'm, I'm conscious of time, Chair. So I've asked my, my core question. I may well return to it once we've heard from um, other contributors. Thank you. Right. <laughs> okay. Because in terms of time, whether you ask the question now or at the end, <laughs> it, it doesn't I, materially make it. All the it, evidence together, I think. Um, I, I, I think they're I think they're accepting that yes, <laughs> it, it will create a, a single unit, um, a planning unit. Yes, they, they were um, tempered and uh, told not to go any higher, only because of the Corio building. In other words, they would have built higher if they had the opportunity. And I believe, based upon what the legal office has admitted, that, um, that, that there isn't a, 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 a case, a case uh, law, or forgive me, a, a case example in, in which we have a, 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 series, a series of buildings owned ultimately by the same um, uh, uh, company. And I, I want to get back to the officers who asked the question right, about well, the application. Well, Does it require an applicant to declare the ultimate owner of a property or it or does the um, council simply accept the subsidiary company's name on the application form which is, I, I suppose i need to wait until after the processes to ask that question of john and that will give me the opportunity if, if i may chair would, would you indulgence to ask further questions of the applicant and, and maybe other 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 contributors right -o. well you've given john good advance notice of <laughs> And and uh, and officers. So, um, can I just ask uh, quickly a bit, uh, before moving on, Miss um, uh, Jenkinson? I mean, obviously, in your um, in your presentation, you you refer to the application as being sort of um, exemplary um, built. But we've got a situation whereby the the largest unit, um, i.e., Unit E, um, has a shortfall in a uh, private um, am amenity space. And, and, and then um, a, a shortfall in communal space, which will then um, ultimately, should this application be granted, serve all residents um, on, on, on the site. So um, who are you ultimately uh, marketing the, the, these um, proposed units for? I mean, what, 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 who do you sort of in, in vis, in, envisage will um, be attracted uh, to these units? Please, thank you. No problem. I mean, I'm not a residential agent, so probably, um, you know, who would be interested in these units is a bit difficult for me to say. Well, but well, I think... well 
Could um, you say a little bit more about, yeah. about, you said it was exemplary, well, I would argue, yeah. well, then it's hardly exemplary if you've got a shortfall, and the irony of it being that you've got a shortfall on the, the largest unit of uh, amenity space, and then communal space, so you're sort of then sort of inviting existing residents to use this outdoor space, communal space, which falls short of 15.5 uh, metres, square metres. Understood. Um, I mean, I think there's different ways in which you can judge an exemplary scheme. So the first thing is on design quality. So I think in respect of the materials we've chosen, they reflect the character of the area. Um, they are um, ultimately robust and high quality. Um, in terms of residential amenity, we are meeting or exceeding the minimum floor space requirements. Um, and also in terms of floor to ceiling heights, um, we're proposing very high quality developments that meet the uh, Mayor's Housing SPG. We also have uh, dual aspects units. Um, we have high quality um, residential units which um, provide decent uh, sized bedrooms, living rooms. Yes, we acknowledge there is a shortfall in um, uh, amenity space, but ultimately, you know, this is a site that is in a very, very central location. It's a very high public transport accessibility level. Um, we are only a short walk to um, uh, parks and obviously to the river as well. So I think, you know, somebody choosing to live in this particular location, um, you know, ultimately has the city there at their doorstep and, and has, um, you know, such a high quality um, uh, unit that with, with access to, to those types of spaces that we think that, you know, overall the, the residential quality, you know, is excellent. And I think the other point to note that Dipesh mentioned is that, you know, ideally, um, you know, um, amenity space would be uh, pr provided over and above 10 square metres, but you are meeting, um, you know, the, the, the three square metres plus. So I think we, we, we can, we, ha we have demonstrated it's high quality. Naz, I think you wanted to come in there quickly. Yes, I did. Sorry, I'll just turn myself back on again. Thank you, Laura. Um, uh, Councillor Cleo Chair, if I could just add to that uh, in terms of we were working with an existing building. So these aren't this isn't a new site. So we, we have constraints that we have to work around. So I think given that we've we've been given these constraints of an existing footprint and, and two buildings that we're working with, um, uh, I think we've gone as far as we can to get these units to be as um, as exceptional as they can be. And as Laura was saying, the materials, we're using a pallet that is high quality. We're using glazed um, brick slips and matte brick slips. We're using aluminium um, flashings. We're using uh, glass balustrades. Um, so I think the, the, the aim is to get a, a homogenous look that, that completes the corner of the site and provides for something that works really, really well on there um, and uplifts the kind of... Um, the, the sort of urban context. And as Michael pointed out earlier, Michael Sakaris, you know, many sites do deal very, very well with corner situations. So I think that's, that, that, that's really where we were coming from. So, um, and in terms of amenity space, yes, there is a provision for communal and private, um, and we were within the guidelines, given the constraints that we've been working with. But not with a communal space. Well, again, we, we have an existing building, so so you know we've managed to get some communal space. Many many developments of similar natures don't don't even manage it on site. So so I think again we we've been facing constraints that we've had to work around. Thank thank you for that. Um, we'll uh, move on, colleagues. Um, if that's all, thank you for your presentations uh, this evening. Thank you. Uh, moving on for uh, moving on to the supporters. And supporters are, are individuals who live within 100 metres of the development site and wish to speak in support of the application. I've got uh, one um, uh, individual um, recorded on my notes, Jennifer Witcherly. Are you present, uh, Jennifer? I am. Right. Oh, there you are. Thank you. Um, uh, are you alone or are there others? I'm alone. Righto, so you've got three minutes, up to three minutes. Um, as you've heard already this evening, um, the constitutional officer will give you 30 seconds uh, warning as you approach uh, the three minutes, should you require the full amount of time. If you could kindly introduce yourself now. This is, I will remind you that this meeting is being live streamed and a recording will be available on the council's YouTube channel. So you may choose to switch off your camera and address the meeting with audio only. Uh, when introducing yourself, please only give your first name and the block or street you live in, but don't um, reveal your full address. 
if that's um, if, if if that's understood. Um, yep. Thank you. So if you could do that, and then we'll start the um, the time immediately after you've initially introduced yourself. Thank you. Yeah. So I'll introduce myself first. So my name is Jennifer and I'm a resident of 48 Grange Walk and I'm speaking today on behalf of those um, lessees of 48 Grange Walk who's, who are in support of the development. Right, thank you. Um, we'll start the clock now. Thank you. You may proceed. Thank you. The proposed development is one that is strongly supported by those lessees for the following reasons. Our view is that the current exterior of the building is tired and requires updating. We understand as part of the proposed development work, the building will be reclad to match 47 Grange Walk, making the building look new and in keeping with the new buildings around it. We believe that once the work is complete, the overall look of the building will be improved and will therefore improve the overall quality and value of our individual units. Following the Grenfell tragedy, the cladding of all buildings has come under scrutiny from health and safety perspective, and it has been widely reported in the press since then that even those buildings that meet those regulatory requirements are not meeting the requirements of current mortgage lenders. Such cladding issues has led to various problems for leaseholders of properties of all sizes, including aborted sales and an inability to refinance. The upgrade to our facade is therefore welcomed by us as this will give us the necessary certificates and the building will meet the relevant fire requirements for lenders. Since our building was completed in 2010, the surrounding area has changed and continued to be developed, including new builds such as the referred to Corio House. The proposals for 48 Grange Walk are therefore contextual, being similar in scale to Corio House and appear from the plans to match the look and quality. Whilst I had my own concerns on the development of Corio House, worrying that that may have been out of character compared to our building, or that it may have had negative impact on privacy. In fact, the final result was positive, and I believe it has improved the overall look of the area, and therefore believe that the improvements to our property will do the same. We are therefore happy for our building to be modernised to match the nearby new builds, and are therefore in support of the proposed development. Um, in summary, we've enjoyed living in the building and have enjoyed being residents of Southwark. The improvements to the overall look of the building and the replacement of cladding will also help to provide, provide uh, solve apologies, a society-wide issue with regards to perceived fire safety, particularly from mortgage lenders. For the above reasons, we hope that the committee members will support Southwark's planning department recommendation and granting planning approval. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, just on the question of cladding, do you have any um, evidence that uh, your cladding is um, unsafe? No, I don't believe my understanding is that the cladding isn't unsafe, but the, the mortgage lenders are, are refusing to give um, mortgages and there is a problem with that for, for all properties. So are you just speaking in, in general? You don't, you're not referring to a specific case on, on, on your block at number Well, I can actually speak on my personal property that has been on the market previously. And um, the feedback that I was getting from my estate agents is that without the EWS1 required certification, people weren't even interested in viewing the property. And that certification doesn't exist because our building wasn't of a height that required it when it was built. We will right. get that certification, I understand, once the building has been reclad. So, so that's not a that's a, a purely sort of speculative comment coming from the um, uh, estate agent. That's not a sort of a formal definitive. And anyway, we'll we'll come back to that in a moment. I've got a well, sorry, if, if you want me just to answer that. So yes. that's right in relation to to my particular experience. What I was referring to is is the experience that is well reported in the press and on the news and the government are trying to make changes to it on, on the basis that mortgage lenders are not lending without that certificate, without that certificate, and it's causing a real problem. Right, oh, but I mean, I think for, for members here this evening, we would need to be we're, we're sort of not, we, we can't, well, whilst we can sort of um, be, whilst we are aware of uh, sort of uh, speculative um, comments out there in the, in the media, um, we have to be very specific to um, the development um, on, um, uh, that we're deliberating on this evening. And in terms of your, your, your block, we would be specifically interested in um, official 
uh, commentary, but we've got two uh, members' hands up. I've got uh, Councillor Seaton, whose hand went up first, followed by Councillor Noakes. Councillor Seaton. And thank, uh, thank you, Chair. And I, I can also thank uh, Jennifer for your presentation and responses to the initial question to the, to the Chair, which is one of my questions. But my, my, my further question, um, as a lessee, would you be required to make a financial contribution to the uh, um, new facade and cladding uh, uh, that is being proposed in this application? But my first question, Chair. No, we, no, we haven't been asked to make a financial contribution. Okay, but I, I know that typically that is what's happening with leaseholders nationwide, that they have to make financial contribution. And therefore that of course is affecting your attitude to this application. So you're not making a financial contribution which is usually what is required of leaseholders. Okay, so that's my first question. Then my, then my second question, uh, I, I suppose, really looks at the, um, you, you're in support of the application, and you talked about the uh, improvement to the, um, the front facade. Um, have you have you had thoughts about the impact of this building on the adjacent building, such as the Collier building, um, and the complaints you most probably would have heard that um, uh, the question of the daylight and sunlight impacts that this building will have. Have you heard those complaints and do you have a view? Question. I'm not a specialist. Having listened to the, um, the views put across today, it sounded like the, the first gentleman that spoke, and apologies, I, I can't remember his name, put forward some about some official testing that had happened and the and the official numbers and the the low impact. So so other than that, I I, I couldn't comment. I, I, if I may share a bit, a bit more, if I ask for this a quick follow up, but go back to my original question. That's only one more. Um, yeah, that's fine. If you had to make a financial contribution to the new facade, new cladding, the new facade, uh, would you willingly make that contribution, even if it was tens of thousands of pounds? Um, okay, I'm guessing that as a hypothetical, well, when you say tens of thousands of pounds, well, okay, so if I was asked to make a contribution, you, okay, well, I, well, if I was asked to make a contribution, I would assess what I, what the benefit versus the cost was that I was being asked to contribute to. At the moment, I have a problem that the value of my flat is being hindered because I don't have the certification for the cladding and we are I believe I'm going to have to do something about that that's either going to require new cladding or it's going to re require some some legal work to be able to get that so I'm already I would have to compare the cost of what that would that would be compared to what it's going to cost me otherwise thank you and that's why you're a supporter thank you very much thank you right that's it Councillor Seaton Councillor Noakes okay oops um uh, thank you for your presentation um, I just wanted, uh, if I could ask Jennifer, um, is it, are you speaking on your, on your own behalf or are you speaking on behalf of a wider group of residents of 46 to 48 and do you know whether they are all of the same view of you or is there a split view? And secondly, do you have any concerns at all about the application uh, in regards to its impact on, on both your building but also the wider area from a planning perspective? So I am speaking, I live in 48 Grange Walk. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of those residents of 48 Grange Walk that um, agree with the application. I understand that six out of the eight units put in written um, support uh, submissions to the planning application response. So that's six out of the eight. And in regards to, do you have any, do you yourself have any concerns in regards to the application about, about either on, on your own building or in regards to the wider area? I, um, as an ex, um, not being an expert, no. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Noakes. Are there any further questions to um, Jennifer Witcher Witcherly from members? No? All righty. Uh, well, thank you very much for your time uh, this evening, uh, Jennifer. Much appreciated. Um, that's the end of questions uh, to yourself. Um, so can I invite um, Ward Councillor, I know that Councillor Damon O'Brien is here, a, a representative of the London Bridge and West Bermondsey Ward. Um, Councillor da Damien O'Brien, you're most welcome. Um, if you could just, um, as we've been following uh, um, the, the, the sort of theme and pattern this evening, if you could just formally introduce yourself and then the, the clock will be started. 
but uh, sure you're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Cleo. Um, yeah, Councillor Damien O'Brien, London Bridge and West Bermondsey Ward. Okay, um, if we could start the clock now. When you Let me know when to go. <laughs> yeah, off, okay, off we so, go. Okay, um, so <laughs> I'm going to try and rattle through a, a number of things. The first one is uh, payment in lieu, of, in lieu of amenity space. I mean, um, where does that money go and who benefits from that? So we've, we're losing the amenity space that should be provided by policy, provided back to the beneficiaries of that space. It's just money. So I think that's something that has to be taken into account. I don't think this application is exemplary design because exemplary design by policy standards requires space and height. It's, not, it's nothing to do with bricks and glass. So this is not an exemplary design at all. Um, the affordable housing delivery, um, Councillor Seaton has, has mentioned that. The, the morality of this is that they're going to use the space to create some very posh flats, which they'll sell at a very high value. I get that, that's fine, they're developers. But don't for a second think that they're helping the London housing market by producing five posh flats. It doesn't work like that. I would bring to the um, committee's attention um, the application for Haven Way, which is on the other side of Corio House. Uh, Councillor Sones will remember this very well as well, and um, so will John Gorst. And we held firm on that. We stopped them from creating an extra layer on top, and it got upheld at appeal. And this is really no different. To say that it's on a corner, even though it's higher than Corio House, I know it's only slightly higher, but it is still higher. Um, means that I think Haven Way actually set the precedent for that. And I don't think we should be approving this. My main point is I've, I've lived here for 16 years. I know Grange Walk like the back of my hand. It's a beautiful, precious medieval street. And at the moment, the uh, proportionality works really well from Corio down to the application site, down to the conservation area. And it will be ruined if we add 50% more height to this application site. It will ruin it. And I, I just can't bear to see such a precious part of Southwark get ruined by someone who wants to build five flash flats. I mean, it's just not fair. And I think we as a committee, I don't know how much time I've got left, we as a committee need to be the custodians of such an important part of our borough. Um, and this is not going to do that. The proportionality is going to be ruined. Um, we talked about the laundry line from like St. Thomas Street from the Shard down to the bottom of Bermondsey Street. Well, this is a smaller version of that. Um, and the, the, the context is going to be ruined. Forget about St. Vincent House across the road because that's well set back. At, you know, it's got a big green area in front of it and it's, it's not really relevant and it's not in the conservation area anyway. What matters is what happens from Corio down to the conservation area on Grange Walk. Um, I, I just can't be more passionate about this street. I love it to bits. It's, it's, it's the, one of the best streets in the ward. It's one of the best streets in the borough. And as, um, as a committee, I think we have a responsibility to protect that. And so please, please, please do not approve this application. I must be close to my three minutes. Yes, yeah, you are. <laughs> Sorry, I was going to say. <laughs> I, do, I do my best. Well, thank I, you, Chair. Thank, thank you for your time, Chair. Thank you. Um, not at all. Thank, thank, thank you, Councillor Byrne. Um, do members have any questions um, for, the, for, for Damien, for, uh, for Councillor Byrne at all? Uh, Councillor Limpopool, and followed by Councillor Seaton. Uh, thank you, Chair. Councillor O'Brien, you're obviously very passionate about uh, the conservation area, and you say that yeah. it is a very beautiful street and a very beautiful area. Can you elaborate a little bit more? Why do you think it is so beautiful, and why do you think that this building is going to be a problem for, for, for the area? Um, thank you, Councillor Linfethor. The issue I have with it is proportionality. So where if we take Corio as the high point on the corner, and if you were to stretch an imaginary piece of string 
across the application site down to the conservation area, you would see a natural sort of progression from one to the other. The application site or the application actually adds 50% more height onto that corner property. And so suddenly you've got a huge descent down into the conservation area. And if you stand at, uh, it's called Fendel Street. I mean, I know that doesn't mean anything to anybody, but if you stand at Fendel Street and look back towards the site, you will see how there's a natural progression up to the Corio building and it works. It's fine. It looks great. But if you add 50% more for no good reason, other than you know, five more posh flats, um, it ruins it because the step becomes so high. The other point to mention as well is Grange Walk is interesting because it's a very beautiful street. If I could afford to live there, I would. But it's actually got a mix of social rent as well as private housing on there. There are actually council tenants that live on Grange Walk. Um, and I just love that about it. It's so diverse. It's got such an interesting flavor. It's got an old school that has been converted into an art house. It's just, it's just a beautiful part of the world. And I just implore this committee not to uh, stuff it up. Could I use that word? I'm not sure. Don't, don't well, ruin you, it. You, you just have. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Don't, don't ruin it by, by this silly little application. Please don't ruin it. I love it so much. Maria, do you have a follow-up question? No, at all? no, no. Thank you, Chair. Right. Okay. <laughs> we understood. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Seaton. Thank, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Bryan, for your presentation and responses to a member's questions thus far. Can I just ask you, just if, if I may, um, to um, further explain why you compare this application with the Haven Way development? Um, what are the similarities that uh, this committee should take into account? That's my first question, Chair. Uh, thank you, Councillor Seaton. Um, <clears throat> okay, so I accept that Corio building and this application are on the corner and Haven Way is not. I, I get that. I understand in policy terms. But the Haven Way application is exactly the same as this application in terms of wanting to uh, profit from putting extra stories on top of what had already been built. And that was justified by the building of the Corio building. Um, in the case of Haven Way, it got uh, rejected. We did a site visit. Um, there were skylights and there were <clears throat> the, the developers ducked and dived and tried every which way to try and get around that. I don't think that this is much different. Um, main, my main issue with this application is the context and the step down and the proportionality from the Corio building down to the conservation area. But I, I only briefly mentioned Haven Way because it was a very similar sort of application. Um, I'm not hanging my hat on that. I mean, I think one of the main differences between Haven, Haven and you've already alluded to the fact that it did have skylights. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and this is a, a flatted um, roof, but... No, I, yeah, I get that. Just, I get that. just to sort of have a clarification. Uh, I, I understand, I wasn't... <laughs> but yes, yes. I don't um, want to over-egg it, but... Yeah. Sort of <laughs> right -o. Um, Are there any additional questions uh, for Councillor O'Brien, um, colleagues. If, if I may, Chair, I just for the follow up then, okay. thank you for Councillor O'Brien for that response to the initial question. And uh, we may ask for, of officers for the clarification of the comparator between Haven Way and this, this particular application. Um, uh, if, if I may, the, um, you've heard reference to the earlier pre app um, stage that some um, officers advise the applicants to moderate the um, heights of the building. Um, sure. Were you involved in that discussion? And did you express an opinion about the height and the likely impact this might have on the conservation area? No, councillor, I wasn't involved in that discussion whatsoever. I knew nothing about it until the application came forward. And if I might say, um, there's no, you know, it's not fair to apply for something ridiculous and then rein it back into something that's deliverable. That's, that, that doesn't mean, you know, if it, it's like the kid that asks for money for lollies and then gets an ice cream instead. You, you, you can't 
you can't go for the jugular and then rein back and think that that's a fair reason as to why your application should be approved. That doesn't work like that. We've got to look at the application that's before us. And in my opinion, quite strongly feel that this application is, um, is a bad one and it should be refused. And if I may share my last question to Monique, of course. Yeah. Um, Go ahead. The, 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 imp, the outcome of this application based upon our decision is potentially to create a single um, planning unit um, in accordance to yeah. the advice we've received and accepted by the applicant. Um, in your opinion, if it is a single planning unit, should there be affordable homes contained in the final development? Absolutely. I mean, I, I think the applicant's been completely disingenuous about that. Um, we have uh, legal evidence of the ownership of both properties. Um, I haven't raised it because it gets way too technical. Um, and, you know, you can, in a court of law, you could probably argue your way out of it. But at the end of the day, both properties have always been owned by the same person. Um, I accept that it's been a while since they first developed the property and got planning permission and therefore um, can probably slide away from doing... Um, well, I'll take a view, of your view. But, your but, view. It's, but it's... It, 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 what, but what they're offering now... It's just five posh flats. That that's it. There's, there, I don't have a problem with that necessarily. There are developers. I get that, but they're not developing. They're not offering anything to the local housing market whatsoever. Okay. Thank you, Chair. And thank you, Councillor O'Brien. Thank, thank you. Thank you, thank, thank you Councillor O'Brien. Um, last call. Any further questions to um, Damien, Councillor O'Brien, colleagues? No. All righty. Thank you very much, um, Councillor O'Brien, for presenting this evening. Thank you. So, colleagues, um, we've heard all our speakers uh, this evening. So this is an opportunity for you to um, ask officers any um, additional questions um, or seek clarification on um, this evening's um, presentations. So uh, I'm going to turn to Councillor Seaton um, first of all. Councillor Seaton, do you have any uh, additional questions. Um, I'll just just to remind um, members. I mean, the main objections um, that we've received have been around um, the phase development um, issue. So um, we've heard from the uh, from our own officers, uh, uh, legal officer uh, John Gorse. We've had a response as well from the applicants, uh, legal officer. So um, I'd just like to know, have we exhausted and have members satisfied themselves um, with officers' uh, response uh, to, to the question uh, this evening? And um, if not, then this is an opportunity for you to, to ask further questions. Um, there's been an issue around sort of sunlight, daylight. Our members are satisfied that uh, uh, with uh, officers' uh, uh, responses. Once again, we've had um, quite a, a detailed tabulated uh, uh, report. Um, do members wish to ask any uh, additional questions uh, regarding that? And uh, similarly um, around design. It's interesting in the report, it refers to uh, the applicants, the, the application as good design, um, applicants refer to it as exemplary. Um, and we've got a shortfall of communal um, amenity space. Um, do you wish to ask any further questions around that and indeed around materials, use of materials and the quality of accommodation? Um, in the addendum, we've got reference that um, counts uh, that Depeche Patel, um, uh, the planning officer, refer to um, the footway and highways and that is going to be written into the section 106. I would like to ask ultimately, because there is repairs to be done, who ultimately would be responsible should this application be rejected? Because I, I understand that um, from the report that uh, should it be granted, the um, applicants uh, would, um, as part of the agreement, uh, repair um, the, the footway. So um, that's a question that I would like to ask initially, but, um, or come back to, but I've got Councillor Seaton's hand up. So go ahead, um, Martin. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, and, um, and thank you for that um, 
useful, very, very useful summary. Uh, I'd just like to clarify with um, uh, the legal officer. I can't see him. Where is it? Oh, there you are. He's smiling. There you are. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> my, my initial question, and I have looked, um, are, is he able to refer to a, a precedence in which um, there, uh, you have a common owner of two adjacent properties which are made into one um, and where there is not an obligation, following on from the earlier response to my question on the creating a single planning unit, that there is not an obligation within policy to require uh, that applicant to, um, uh, provided it's at the, at the exceeds the minimum of 10 units here at 11, uh, to provide at least one truly affordable dwelling. Uh, is he able to, to refer to precedents that suggest that um, that is not appropriate, or, or indeed, are there precedents that suggest that there is a, a, it is appropriate to ask for um, a, a, at least one of these dwellings are truly affordable as in, in, in compliance with our policies? Uh, thank, thank you, Councillor Seaton. Um, I, I think in, in, in answer to that, um, it, but the answer would be that, um, in my view, it's it, it's not in accordance with um, uh, with our policies because, uh, as as at the moment, um, I form the view that uh, they they are separate planning units. I take your point that um, uh, from now on they might be considered together, um, but but with the view that they are separate planning units, I don't see as a matter of um, uh, of our policy that that, that we can properly. Um, uh, require uh, an affordable housing to um, uh, to 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 be offered. Um, the planning agent, the applicant, gave um, quite a, a breakdown as to the history of the the, the site, and uh, you know I, I've for, heard that for uh, I've seen details of the ownership, um, and, and and as I said earlier when I was asked, I think the, in view of the duration, the long duration from. Uh, 2007 to 2021, 2007 when they originally part acquired part of the site, and then changes in the uh, the corporate makeup. Um, I think the the the, um, uh, the ownership is uh, is very difficult to argue that there has been unity of ownership. Uh, and as the legal office, uh, the uh, solicitor for the um, uh, planning applicant uh, planning applicant said. Uh, there is this case law, this brand law case, which I referred to earlier, uh, we, 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 which um, emphasised that single ownership was, was not uh, the necessary uh, an issue when deciding on phasing. So uh, I think it's very difficult for us to argue. Uh, that, that this is my legal opinion. Obviously, um, uh, members don't necessarily have to accept it, but I think it's very difficult to argue from a planning policy point of view that we should be looking um, as this is a phase development or for a, for a contribution for affordable housing. Much as I know that uh, uh, members would like to do that. And, and, and as I said earlier, officers are very aware of members scrutiny um, uh, of developers and also ourselves. And, and that's why we do look at this very closely. And we, we very much like to come back to you and say, we think this is uh, justified here, but I'm afraid that my, you know, you're asking for my legal opinion uh, and my legal opinion is I think we're gonna be in difficulties if we do rely on that uh, particular point on, in these circumstances. Mm. Sorry, Chair, um, I, I, know, I know John and I know each other for a little while. You haven't actually answered my question directly. Um, in the creation of a, a single planning unit, is it reasonable, therefore, to expect if you're creating a new planning unit, that that planning unit, if it exceeds the 10 minimum, should, should provide at least one affordable home? Uh, no, I don't think it is, uh, Councillor Seaton. And, and the reason uh, I don't think it is that sort of at the moment, they are not a single planning unit. Um, uh, and, and therefore, I don't think, for a matter of policy, we are entitled to uh, to, re to require that. Okay, thank you for that. Thank you for that uh, much clearer response. And uh, and it is for members to take a view, of course. But thank you for that much clearer response. <laughs> but my, my second follow up on, on this, and uh, it is interesting uh, how these things evolve. Um, and I've, I've taken note of the ownership issue, and uh, notwithstanding the 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 current um, potential precedent that you've cited and uh, others have cited earlier, uh, it does appear on the surface that um, unless the form that is submitted to you 
makes it clear of the ultimate owner. As far as your as far as your opinion is concerned, it is it is assumed that they are separate and dis distinct owners. So, and I'm, I've not seen one of these applications um, at this early stage, the initial application form, which is I must do something about, I suppose. But um, does the form require that an applicant declare the mm. ultimate owner of a subsidiary company? Yes or no? A straightforward yes or no without all the preamble, please. <laughs> oh, well, I'm, I'm not, I wasn't sure that I, I, I gave you all that. But uh, the, the, the answer, the, what I would just say before I, oh, before I give you my yes, or yes no. what <laughs> I would just say very simply is that we have a lot of op applications from offshore companies, councillor, and we really do not know. But the answer is no. Uh, yeah. It does not require that. And, and as I say, with okay. offshore companies. That's understood. That you are on this concept of time, and I, you know, I've been in a notice position with the chair. So, and if, if with, with your indulgence, chair, if I may ask my last question, if I may ask my last question. Honestly, and... conscious of time. Go ahead. <laughs> I want to make well, sure. There wasn't three. <laughs> I'll no, limit myself to three. Please do. Yeah. Go, go I'll limit myself to three. Don't you worry. Uh, uh, and, and if you've your responses that. Um, the, the uh, planning department doesn't ask what the ultimate owners of a planning unit, and therefore um, the, that opinion, that fact is not taken into account at this stage. Um, your initial opinion is that um, to, to create a planning unit um, which exceeds the term minimum, there is, in your initial opinion, you're not referring to case precedent at this stage, um, there's not a requirement to provide a, an affordable unit even if it exceeds our, our, our minimum, which is interesting, okay? So if it had been 20, there, there wouldn't be a requirement to build, to, to provide any affordable, mm -hmm. which is a, a, a serious loophole, but I don't think that was intended. So my question, Chair, um, has to be this. Um, in, in view of the potential impact this, this particular development will have on the conservation area, um, the term used, and I think it's quite an interesting term, the washing effect, from the from the corner down to the uh, uh, down to the uh, um, the, the uh, uh, conservation Terrace area. houses. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. Um, uh, is that would you not consider that to be of a, a material planning consideration if that were changed and you are building what is effectively a very large bulk um, uh, for, in view of the conservation area? Is that a material planning consideration? Yes or no, please. Is, is, yeah, is, sorry, that, is that can, a question I can, to, to, to... I can answer that. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Oh, exactly, <laughs> it comes out. Okay. Thank you, Chair and Councillor Seaton. Thank you for your, that question. Uh, the, the washing line uh, idea that um, has been proposed by uh, objectors um, and repeated by um, uh, councillors, ward councillors, is not really a planning policy. Uh, something I recognise in planning policy, it it, uh, it is simply perhaps a um, a construct, but it's it's certainly not a a definitive or or, or um, established uh, uh, policy principle. Um, in uh, so we would we wouldn't um, ap apply that. Uh, we uh, it's not something we we could uh, require uh, by uh, in terms of policy to apply here. You're mute, you're mute. Oh, happy? No chair, but I restricted myself to three. All oh, right, okay. oh, right. um, John, just on the, the theme of sort of single unit phase development, haven't we got a bit of a, a sort of oxymoron here? Because the, the, com, the, the shortfall or the communal um, amenity space that will be offered to all the residents, albeit that the, the that there's a shortfall. I mean, that is, it's, it's by definition, it's being treated as a single unit, isn't it? The fact that, you know, the communal space, the outdoor communal space that will be created if this proposal were to be granted is then in use for everybody, current residents and potential, potentially new residents. 
Well, well, Chair, that, that, that's a separate point. And, and as you um, uh, indicate, I mean, that is a, a material planning consideration. Um, uh, it, it, it's uh, it, because they're not providing that um, sufficient space, uh, as has been said by councillors, it, it's not except doesn't meet the requirements of exemplary design. Uh, so um, you know, that is something that uh, yes, you, you know you can certainly take into uh, consideration because that's not been met. The architect did point out, uh, and and I can understand it, the fact that they were existing buildings and therefore there was more difficulties with the design. Uh, and and yes, there is that mitigation. Um, but the fact is that it doesn't meet the policy requirements and you know, that is a consideration. You're mute, Chair. Sorry, Chair, you're mute. Oh, sorry. I, I think I did under, actually understand that point, but the point that Councillor Seaton was referring to about sort of whether it, um, the, the, the two sites once they're amalgamated, as it were, um, would be one site, but, and they, they sort of, you know, they differed and here around the legal officer that is, and, and then and it had to be sort of teased out of, of him to sort of a, a agree ultimately that, yes, it could be considered. But the fact that immediately, if it were to be built out, that all residents would have access to the communal space, that, isn't that by definition like one unit anyway? Wouldn't that be perceived as one unit? Well, well a it single would. a single unit. Well, it, well, it do, would. Do, 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 am I articulate? Am I, is, yeah, is, I, I, do you I understand the, what I'm trying to to get at? Yeah, I see the point you're you're making, Chair. But uh, the point is that it would be at that stage a single unit. But before they carry out the work, they are still separate. Se separate, yes. Yeah. So, yeah. so I, I don't think that that, that yes. changes. Yes, all right. Thank you. Yeah, no, I agree. Councillor Noakes, you've been very patient. Thank you. Yeah, um, just two final questions. Uh, I think for me, the, the key issue is really around uh, the impact on the conservation area. So, and the other one is around the height um, of the proposed application. So. In regards to the um, uh, application, uh, sorry, the conservation area, I just wondered if Michael can say, uh, as a final point, whether he feels that there is any sort of uh, negative impact on the conservation area by the additional three stories that are being proposed. Um, I know the applicant said, well, you know, that Correa House is essentially the same height as what's being proposed, but obviously Correa House is not part of the, it's not part of Grange Walk. It sits separate you know across the road from Grange Walk itself so it's not part of that that line of, of buildings that include the conservation area so I would just like it you know and it brings the height of the height of Correa build, building essentially that much further forward um, and, and obviously closer to the conservation area so I'd just like to hear a final thought from Michael on that and then my final question is in regards to the 2015 application um, or pre-application I think it was um, Obviously, the, I, I can't I can't seem to access that presumably because it was a pre-application, so I haven't been able to look up the detail of it. But the inference is that it was uh, it would have been refused based on height, uh, the additional stories. And I just wonder, are we? Well, I'd like clarity as to why our position has changed in relation to why height is now this additional height is now acceptable when it wasn't considered to be acceptable in 2015. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Notes. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chair. I could I could make a start on both those, um, and then uh, perhaps uh, if uh, colleagues will uh, consist, if if um, if I've not got all the details of the various uh, the twenty fifteen application, um, but what um, I, I think uh, uh, in terms of the conservation area, I think uh, it's it's been crucial here and very important to note that the site is not within the conservation area. Uh, it is separated from the conservation area by a pretty large building, uh, 1980s uh, style building, which is uh, largely, um, which was shown in the images that were presented to you in the planning committee, in the, in the pack, and um, is, um, we've calculated, roughly the same size, in fact, as the 
entire terrace that you can see also in that view. So physically, it's quite a significant separation from the conservation area. A lot of that was taken into account when you consider the impact of something on a conservation area, its visual impact as well as um, uh, 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 you know uh, the uh, you know when when you uh, the sense of enclosure and um, uh, presence, if you like, uh, um, it is it is an important consideration. Presence and visibility are uh, not in themselves harmful, uh, particularly if it's um, if it's well separated from from a conservation area. But quite rightly, we publicised it as being. In uh, potentially in the setting of a conservation area, it is indeed on the same street as a conservation area. But uh, a, a, a number of factors ca come into play in terms of visibility. When uh, when you look down um, uh, Grange Walk, uh, you take in the fine terrace of uh, of properties that are all within the conservation area, and they are uh, uh, very well established and and uh, and uh, set forward there. Um, but as I said, they are quite separated from the site by the, a large 1980s building. And then in the distance, uh, not, not, uh, very close in proximity to this development would be Corio House. And Corio House um, is, um, is on Grange Walk. Grange Walk sort of winds its way around Corio House. So Corio House has its address on Grange Walk as well. So it is very much a, a part of the, of the, the context that we are that we are looking at, it is changed significantly by Corio House, which actually fills the fills the vista if, in the distance uh, as you as you look as you look down um, uh, down uh, Grange Walk. So, um, and there is no point at which we looked at it very carefully. There is no point at which the proposed development, the increased height, uh, peering over the rooftops, is. Uh, comes into visual conflict with um, with the conservation area. The conservation area is untouched by this proposal, and for that reason, whilst there might be some visibility, um, it isn't uh, it isn't causing harm to the setting of the conservation area. And that is the point, I guess, that we need to balance. That the committee needs to balance here. Uh, you know, when when you're considering impact on conservation area, you need to consider harm. And that's what the National Planning Policy Framework says to you um, in, in the context of, of, of the setting of a conservation area. So that is what we took into account and that's what uh, is being presented to you. In terms of the, uh, the height and the context of the 2015 pre-application inquiry, at the time, um, uh, Corio House had been permitted, but its impact had not been envisaged or considered fully because the building had not been um, uh, had not been constructed out, and its uh, its its effect on the local streets and the local uh, area had not been fully uh, envisaged. So um, at that time, the concern was that um, uh, that uh, 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 you know when uh, 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 were were we to permit a building of this scale in this location, it would be uh, overly dominant and inappropriate. But when we now uh, in the fullness of time, and now that Corio House has been constructed, um, the, uh, it, it is clear that the, this building would come back in to within the prevailing height, the established heights. The words that I used, or that I that I asked, uh, that I uh, that I used to present the the point about the height and answer the, the the question, the earlier question about height. The prevailing height does come into play, and you need you need to take that into consideration. Um, so. Uh, the, 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 you know, that is the uh, that is how we review or how we viewed this proposal in the context of Corio House uh, today, uh, and how we viewed it in the context of the permission, but unconstructed at the time in 2015 uh, of uh, Corio House at that time. Um, uh, Dipesh, is there anything you want to add about that sort of the actual dates of the Corio House permission and uh, and the pre-application advice? I think just to follow up, I think you've answered um, covered most of the points, but at, at the time, just reiterating that point for the pre-app, Corio House wasn't completed. So um, I think I mentioned in the presentation, we took a precautionary approach um, in, in advice on height and massing. And, and as Michael mentioned, after the Corio was completed, um, it became clear that the site could, could take some additional heights. 
Okay, Th thank thank you for that um, detailed response, uh, Michael. And then, chair, uh, sorry, Chair, can I just say yes. if you'd like oh. to have a screen break as well? Oh, uh, gonna... yes, yeah. So what what time is it now? I can't, I, I haven't got um, a 8 clock. 20, was it 8.25? Right, so if we return at 8.00. Oh, no, 9. It's it must 9, be nine. sorry. 9.20, we'll return 9 at 9.30. 9.25, 9.25. Yeah. Okay, we'll return, at, we'll have a quick comfort break. 